everybody. This is Robin. Can you all hear me? Okay. We're getting ready to start. Everybody who can't sit down at least find a place to stand. Okay, well, welcome. Thanks for coming this morning, and thanks so much for helping to make our fifth anniversary celebration such a huge success. Today, I'm very happy to be able to introduce entrepreneur and Linden Lab board member, Mitch Caper, who will be speaking about what the future holds for Second Life. For those of you who don't know, Mitch Caper is a software designer, entrepreneur, activist, and philanthropist. He founded Lotus Development Corporation in 1982, and designed Lotus 123, the killer app which made the PC ubiquitous in business. He has been a leading startup investor in companies such as UUNet, Real Networks, and of course Linden Lab, the maker of Second Life. He is the co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the founding chair of the Mozilla Foundation, and on the board of the Level Playing Field Institute. So here's Mitch. Uh, give us a moment while we get our avatars in place, and we will be right there. Robin, can you? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Good morning, everyone. It always feels like standing on the edge of a precipice, giving a live talk in Second Life. There's always something interesting and amusing and unexpected that happens. But I'm awfully glad to be here this morning uh, to talk to you and uh, share some of my thoughts on this fifth anniversary of Second Life. It's actually the fifth anniversary of being alive, uh, open to the public service. I mean, Philip actually started working on this in 1999, I think, and I got involved very, very early as the first investor and uh, helping Philip think things through uh, back in, um, in 2000. Um, and if we go back five years or eight years, it just would have been impossible to imagine everything that's happened in Second Life since then. Um, and it's a testament to all of your creativity and your enthusiasm. Um, I've called Second Life uh, a disruptive innovation in the sense that as it plays out, it's creating a kind of an ecosystem. Uh, and that ecosystem actually is going to disrupt and force the reorganization of a lot of previously existing economic and social patterns. I mean, I think that although this hasn't happened yet, I can foresee a time where the web and the internet that are going to just change irrevocably as, as they go 3D. Um, and I can also see ways in which today we're, we're prisoners uh, of the tyranny of geography, uh, and that, that's going to change as, as virtual worlds um, mature. So when I was originally asked to give this talk, I thought I'd spend my time focusing on these dynamics of, of innovation and disruption. But in thinking more deeply about the meaning of this fifth anniversary and in sensing the current atmosphere around Second Life, I decided to take a slightly different tack that focuses on the opportunities and possibilities going forward. So I have just a few simple points I'd like to share with you today. Uh, near the end, I have a couple of brief video clips to show you about some things that I'm working on that hopefully point the way to the future and hopefully will we'll stream in properly. But if they don't, I'm advised that my whole talk and the video clips and the graphics are going to be put up as a podcast and accessible. Um, so whether you see it now or you're seeing it later, uh, I hope you'll enjoy that. And then, as promised, I'll be closing with an announcement about an exciting new uh, initiative from, from Linden Lab. So here we go. Um, my first point, you know, um, when we experience, when we create and participate in a new technology ecosystem, like Second Life, 
we bring all of ourselves to it. We bring the good, um, the bad, uh, and the ugly. Um, and so what we choose to do with the possibilities is extremely important. You could have the, yes, thank you. You put up the next slide. Um, so um, hopefully you're seeing a slide of Philip and me from back in the early days of Second Life. Um, you know, Philip's original vision was about making a better world and a world in which we could become our better selves, if not our, our best selves. And I can remember when Philip was talking about that at the time, 2000 and, and in the run-up to the um, release of Second Life, I have to say that his, his idealism was greeted by and large with extraordinary skepticism. Um, in fact, the whole prospect of Second Life was regarded as a non-starter by the investment um, community. And the idealistic aspect was essentially ignored, except by you pioneers and early adopters and first residents. And you're the folks who believed in the possibilities and made the dream real. Philip always said that the residents would create the content. And that totally flew in the face of the conventional wisdom of those early years, 2000 to 2003, which what people believed then was that only artists and design professionals could create content for, for 3D worlds. And there were a number of other beliefs that have proven to be just utterly and completely, fortunately, incorrect. And as, as five years have shown, there's in fact an enormous diversity of uses and purposes in Second Life, which, which run the gamut from A to Z, uh, many of which are really dramatic demonstrations of uh, unleashing of human potential and, and creativity. So Second Life, at age five, serves many purposes. <clears throat> it's a means of economic empowerment. Um, it's a creative outlet. And as you know, many people around the world are making a living on the creative work they love doing in Second Life. And we're now uh, seeing much broader uses in education and philanthropy and art and fashion, medical research, architecture and design, science and entertainment. Um, just a few, uh, a few high points. Uh, explosive growth in the higher education sector with hundreds of college courses being offered. Lots of use by architects and city planners to engage citizens in rebuilding actual physical cities. Uh, incredibly interesting work by a researcher in Japan controlling avatars with brain waves. And increasingly, musicians are finding real life success through their work in Second Life. But what I want to highlight for a moment are some of the uses by nonprofits and social change organizations. Could I have the next slide, please? Oops. <laughs> this hour I can only blame on myself. Let's go, let's go forward again, please. My slides are out of order. Very good. Um, one of the things that's going on is significant usage and participation uh, by communities of the disabled in Second Life. Uh, a wonderful opportunity for uh, increased participation and for having a kind of uh, 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 presence and interaction that is maybe physically impossible, but virtually uh, very, very empowering. Uh, next slide. Um, lots of different kinds of uh, uh, awareness building, consciousness raising, and fundraising activities uh, on the part of, of nonprofits and, and, and causes. This is just, uh, these, these few slides are ones that I picked out actually of a Flickr photo stream uh, on the nonprofits and Second Life. This one is for uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, next slide. And this is a poster advertising or talking about the, the nonprofit commons and the efforts to really bring together uh, nonprofits and provide space and resources and uh, uh, um, a way to, to come together to uh, help strengthen the missions of all of these uh, organizations, of which there are many, many, many. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a uh, anti-war protest, avatars against the war. Uh, 
fact, it might even be somewhere, although I didn't find it, uh, avatars for the war. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but the point is that the same kinds of activist impulses that cause people to come together in the physical world begin to bring together people in the virtual world, and they're finding the tools and the means to organize and to um, uh, to work for change. And all of that is, uh, is incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, encouraging. But one thing that anyone who uses Second Life on a regular basis knows and understands extremely well, it's still a kind of a frontier world. And life on the frontier um, is challenging. Next slide, please. So hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is a, a uh, photo of um, a frontier town in the western part of the U.S. from the 19th century. Uh, frontier mythology runs pretty deep uh, in, in, in the U.S. Um, and as you heard, I actually co-founded an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, when we have a new technology platform and a new techno ecosystem, it always starts out in a kind of a frontier condition, where there are fewer rules, there are fewer conventions, we're left more to our own devices. And my experience is um, that uh, it brings out both the most and the least noble in us. And I'm sorry if there is a lag in the appearance and the resing in of some of the slides. This is a frontier condition of things not being completely synchronized, so hopefully you'll bear with me. My point about the frontier condition, though, is that while there's a lot of it in Second Life, there's nothing fundamentally new or different about this phenomenon. I mean, I'm reminded of something from more than 10 years ago, probably closer to 15, when the internet itself was in a frontier condition, let's say 1990 to 1994, just, be just before and as the first graphical browsers were, were coming out. Uh, the internet had been available just to researchers, and um, the government began opening it up so that anybody who wanted to connect could, could connect. And so people did start connecting. And I remember teaching a class at the Media Lab at MIT, and one of the students was complaining vociferously about the clueless newbies on the net. And you could always tell who they were because they had an AOL.com email address. And we had a conversation, and I said, so what you're saying is just based on the mere fact of knowing the domain of the email address, you can tell what kind of person they are, and you impute a kind of a cluelessness and bad behavior. And he said, that's right. Well, I said, well, you know, that kind of stereotyping, if it, if it involves skin color, would be called racism. So if it involves what domain you're coming from, maybe we should call it domainism. Uh, and in fact, there were a lot of new settlers, and in fact, to the internet, and in fact, they did less well understand the conventions and how to survive, but it was still not an excuse for the kind of stereotyping uh, and uh, prejudicial kinds of behavior that uh, are all too easy uh, to get into. So whether we're talking about the internet, the web, second life, or future disruptions, we're still going to be dealing with these phenomena. And so the, these technical ecosystems are really a stage in which our dreams are played out. Um, and, and, and we become who we imagine ourselves to be. Uh, and this projection of our wishes and desires, our secret selves, has nowhere been more evident than in virtual worlds like Second Life because of their immense potential as um, reality-making uh, kinds of systems. So I'd skip very quickly over a slide called a moment of insight. I'm not going to ask to back up to that, but I'm going to tell in, uh, no, no, just leave the slides where they are, please. Thank you. Um, I had my own moment of insight about the potential of virtual worlds a couple of years ago, and I've told this story a couple of times. Some of you have probably heard it, um, so I'm going to tell it in uh, a very uh, summarized form. But 
there was a time in which there started to be a significant number of mixed reality events, probably 2006, I'm looking at Robin, and the one that um, struck me was when Suzanne Vega, the singer-songwriter, appeared on an NPR radio program called The Infinite Mind, hosted by John Hockenberry, and she performed uh, live uh, some, of her, some of her music. And at the same time, the entire event was projected into Second Life. So there was a, a, a theater or a studio somewhat like this. So there was a stage. Uh, she was on stage. She had a virtual guitar. And the audio was being, being streamed in so that if you were logged into Second Life, you could come in and uh, find a good seat. If you didn't like the seat you're in, you could sit closer and you could chat with your neighbor and you could listen to the music. And it was just like being at a concert. And I watched the concert video. I didn't happen to actually be there, but it was it was shot and edited. And and what had struck me when I watched that was that there was a fundamental element of reality to this. Yes, the resolution was fuzzier and uh, it was, didn't have all the wonderful sort of vividness of, of real reality. But it felt like being in a real place at a real time, interacting with real people, having a real experience. And the possibility of actually creating that out of the imagination and then being able to realize it in a shared kind of way, I think is just incredibly powerful. And as I describe that experience and talk to other folks, they had similar experiences. It had been like we had, were all up in the spaceship um, together. Um, so that was my moment of, of personal enlightenment. And what do we do with all this power to imagine and actually create um, a world? For all of the, the fascination we have with the power of technology, I've come to believe ultimately it's really what's in our hearts that determines the uses and the impact. And so, and this is my point, it's really a choice to work to make things better, just as it's a choice to do things which have a negative impact. And so I want to encourage all of us to see the opportunities and to rise above kind of pettiness and personal complaint and to reach for the best and highest within ourselves in making what we, what we can of this opportunity. Uh, which brings me to my next point, and if I could have the next slide, please. The pioneer era in Second Life is beginning to draw to a close. It's been five years, and we're at the beginning of a transition. Uh, and I think it's an irrevocable transition. And I'm hoping what you see now is a slide of a um, technology adoption curve, a classic bell curve that shows early adopters on the left and then a set of uh, pragmatists as we move from left to right uh, and, uh, and so on all the way over to the right edge of the curve which are the, the laggards. This, this technology adoption curve is, is well known um, for um, the way to characterize the adoption of these disruptive new innovations. Now, where are we on this? Okay, could I have the next slide, please? When you see this resin, you should be seeing a big red <laughs> vertical arrow just at the margin between the early adopter phase uh, and, the, and the pragmatist phase. That's really where we are today. And I think that has some very um, important implications. And I want to talk about that for, for a minute. So the first is, in the earliest wave of pioneers in any new disruptive platform, the, the, the marginal and the dispossessed are overrepresented. Not the sole constituents by any means, but people who feel they don't fit, who have nothing left to lose, or who are impelled by some kind of dream, who may be outsiders to whatever mainstream they're coming from, all come and arrive early in disproportionate numbers. It was the way uh, the West in the U.S. was settled. It's the way Second Life has been settled. And in fact, those early pioneers find a very arduous environment. In the early days, you really have to want to be here because life, uh, in certain ways, is very, very difficult. Uh, in fact. 
too difficult for most people. Uh, it, 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 it's unavoidable in some sense that there will be a very high attrition rate in, in the early years while a platform is being uh, built out. It doesn't stay that way, of course. It can't. Uh, but uh, the, the difficulties of conditions cause those who stay to um, you know, really bond together, have something in common. Uh, and that sort of arduous frontier conditions really give these environments their charm and their character, but also uh, their challenges. And all that is, is changing uh, as we speak because people are in the process of discovering that virtual worlds have very pragmatic values uh, to them. And this is especially true and will be true in the enterprise sector as businesses seek to uh, be more productive, be more efficient, utilize the latest technology. Uh, and um, they will find lots of pragmatic uses uh, for virtual worlds. In, in the same way that in the early years of the internet, um, businesses were not big participants, but they discovered in the mid-1990s that it was actually necessary uh, to be on the net in a whole variety of ways in order to be part of the, 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 the global market system. I think the pragmatic adoption is going to be fueled not just by business, but in all sorts of other sectors, because we can see the value proposition, forgive my business buzzword, being established, uh, whether it's in, in, in architecture or in education or in uh, for nonprofits, it is simply valuable for people to uh, uh, be able to use um, uh, a virtual world. And that is going to make things challenging for people who feel that as the frontier is being uh, uh, settled uh, and there's less novelty and in some senses less freedom, um, it is always uh, an uneasy transition for uh, uh, the pioneers. Uh, and I believe we're going to go through that um, again. But I think these... I think the larger prospect is of bringing the value of Second Life and virtual worlds to uh, the world at large. Uh, and to do so, it has to be opened up. It has to be made um, uh, easier to use. And uh, there are um, some things, I think, which, uh, which have to happen. Um, there are some things that uh, Linden Lab has to do, um, and I continue as a as a board member uh, to advocate strongly for uh, to allow the potential of the platform to unfold. It, it has to do things in improving the robustness of the platform, in improving ease of learning and ease of use, so more people can enjoy it, and it has to extend and evolve both the technical architecture and governance to better support the great diversity of purposes and uses that people have. And it, is, it needs to do this in a more decentralized kind of way, uh, uh, one that Thomas Jefferson, if you were around, would be, would be proud of. And I'm you know, pleased to say that you will be hearing and seeing much more on these points in days and weeks and months to come. And those announcements will come from the company and its, uh, uh, and its executives. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased about all of that. My own interest, personal interest, in the evolution of virtual worlds is in making it into a medium that um, enhances interpersonal presence, or uh, I sometimes refer to uh, increasing the um, uh, emotional bandwidth of interaction. And while I think it's great that um, we can do these types of gatherings or more uh, collaborative uh, 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 meetings uh, you know, around a table where m many people are speaking, there's still something missing. Uh, and let me talk about that for a minute. I can remember, if I go back a couple of years, 
before voice came into Second Life. When people got together, they communicated, but they communicated completely through text chat. And uh, that was very exhilarating the first time you did that. And it worked really well in many circumstances for many people. And I never liked it. <laughs> I always wanted a voice. I wanted the kind of information or maybe meta information that voice conveys that text does not. Because voice, through its tone, carries a whole stream of, of information about the attitude of the speaker, the speaker's intention, which is just not present in text chat. And the voice is not a panacea, and there are still many applications in which it's actually a drawback and not um, you know, uh, a positive affordance. Uh, my intuition was that there'd be it would be hugely empowering to add uh, add voice in a in a fundamental way to the platform. And when the team actually produced that, and we saw the incredibly widespread adoption of it, it was gratifying in the extreme. And now it's not really possible to imagine the experience without voice. Well, that's great. What else? Well, there's a lot of other meta information that's filtered out of our avatar to avatar encounters. And what's missing today is the natural conveyance of things like body language and gesture and facial expression. Now, there are some ways if you're extremely facile with the keyboard and a real power user, you can. Um, move yourself through some animations. You can simulate some of what I talked about. But for 99% uh, of the people, that's just not going to be e even, even conceivable. So what's missing today for a whole set of um, uses are going to be uh, making things more realistic when you want them to be more realistic in terms of the presentation um, of your avatar. And I just want to show two short videos that illustrate a couple of things. This is very experimental. And if this doesn't work properly, we're going to have to go to the, the podcast afterwards. But if we could get ready to um, uh, do this, then I'm going to first tell you what you're going to see. And then hopefully you're actually going to see it. So um, the first thing is a much more realistic looking avatar. And particularly for business meetings and meetings between people who know each other, the ability to look more like yourself when you want to would be a positively good thing. And there are some technologies that have been developed that will create an extraordinarily realistic uh, avatar uh, out of a single digital photograph and a lot of algorithmic magic. These are not Second Life avatars yet, but uh, they could be at some point. And I'm going to try to show you a short clip of uh, an avatar of me that was taken. And you have to understand, this is just done one digital photograph, made the 3D model, and then it animated this, this short clip. So um, if we could play that, that would be great. Whoever is going to, of my many silent and invisible helpers, to stream the first clip, that would be swell. Somebody says, please press play on your movie player. OK, if you're talking to me, uh, I'm going to try to hit, I hit a button. And let's see if. If that's playing or not. Yep, it's streaming. It looks great. Good, because I can't see it, but hopefully you're seeing it. They see it. Terrific. Thank you. Right. So, good. 
um, that's actually what I look like. This avatar um, you're seeing up on stage here that was done uh, by an artist who is really good at Photoshop and it sort of looks like, like me. So um, I think we're moving in the direction of much uh, greater realism. Great. Now I'm going to introduce the second clip. It's also a very short clip. Um, I'm going to tell you what you're going to see when you see it. Um, and then we're going to play it. So one thing I've been doing in uh, my office over at Caper Enterprises is fiddling with uh, a special camera, a 3D camera, not yet on the market, but coming soon, that in a single $100 webcam does what a million dollar motion capture studio does. It can extract out a 3D model in real time of the scene that's in front of it. Um, and you're going to see a demo of my collaborator, Philippe Bossu, uh, using software he's written with the camera to control his avatar in Second Life. No keyboard, no mouse. You'll see um, a split screen. And he, Philippe, the real Philippe, will be doing things like leaning forward, which will cause the avatar to move forward, and leaning backward, which will cause the avatar to move backward, and leaning to the side to turn, um, and um, doing some other things, ending in a jump. He'll jump, and the avatar will jump. And so what we're doing in this is just uh, showing that you can actually control the avatar without any user interface. It just does what you do. OK, let's, um, let's try to roll that film. And I'll look at the IM channel to see if people are actually seeing it. This is, again, a 20-second clip. So press play on my movie player. OK, I did that. Oh, good. Oh, good. Great. So let me just say a couple of things about this. Uh, first, um, you're seeing the work in progress. This is work in the lab. It's not uh, finished. But it is actually using production Second Life and the open source uh, Linden Viewer, uh, which we modified. Second, we understand all sorts of things need to happen, like it needs to work when you're sitting down, not just standing up. Um, and we still are, have yet to demonstrate doing really cool stuff like facial expressions. And so you're seeing research. You're not seeing a uh, product that is uh, close to uh, being available. But it is on the way. And we're making lots and lots and lots of progress on this. And I think it's um, just a matter of time before technologies like this that are in the lab become mainstream and integrated into virtual worlds. And I think it is going to be uh, quite, uh, quite uh, powerful, um, especially when you think about the world that we're moving into in the 21st century, the skyrocketing cost of fuel, um, a real corporate imperative to manage and reduce their carbon footprints. So at the point at which interaction via avatars begins to actually substitute for face-to-face -face meetings, you have something uh, just uh, extraordinary. And we can't predict the number of years that is, but we can see, we can see it coming. And we'll be able to see coming many other innovations and inventions that uh, are happening throughout the entire uh, ecosystem of virtual worlds. It's what's incredibly uh, exciting. OK. Now, let me move to the final point, which is to talk about something interesting and exciting that uh, Lyndon is going to be doing to further stimulate these kinds of um, achievements, which is, and I'm pleased to announce, the creation of the Lyndon Prize, 
Thank you. Here's our slide coming up. Lyndon is going to establish an annual award for superlative achievement that exemplifies the mission elevating the human condition through using Second Life. And any resident or institution or organization using Second Life in an innovative, as an innovative disruptive technology is going to be um, eligible. Uh, this is going to be an annual prize. Um, the prize amount is going to be $10,000 US paid in Linden dollars. Uh, and the judges are going to come from a broad cross-section of participants, including, uh, including, uh, uh, including residents. And there will be lots of details coming out about this, uh, the blog and the website. And the fundamental motivation here is to recognize special achievements by residents or organizations using Second Life and to call attention to the ways in which it is uh, being used to improve the human condition. There's so much of that going on that it's it's terribly important to let ourselves and the rest of the world know uh, about all of that. And I'm very pleased that uh, the company is able um, to do this. And I wanted to thank all of you for your uh, your participation, your ongoing faith in the company, for uh, reaching deep into uh, yourselves to find your best selves and to help realize the, the potential and the dream. Uh, stay the course, and thank you very much. I'm uh, going to give this uh, back to Robin now. We're not taking questions today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, keep an eye on the blog. We'll be putting more information up about the Linden Prize uh, so that you can get all the details. Um, in closing, I just want to thank every resident who has risen to their highest potential and contributed to making Second Life the world of inspiration and creativity it is today. Second Life is not only driven by technology, but largely by the ingenuity of the residents, you. And thanks also to all the 600 plus resident exhibitors, the many volunteers, the many roundtable organizers, and the translators. All of you have helped to make our celebration a very, very special one. Thanks for coming, and uh, we will be seeing you soon, I'm sure. Bye-bye.